What's going on, everybody? You're tuned into another episode of the Music Mastery Podcast with your host, Lizzie the Gifted. And on this episode, we've got a very special guest, an amazing, talented singer who I was lucky enough to link up with on Instagram, on the gram. Please help me in welcoming Reagan Hoffman. Thank Reagan, you. Thank, thank you so much for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I appreciate you coming on the show. So yeah, we, we I think... Uh, so for, for people who've listened to the podcast before and saw I did an episode with someone named Peyton Lamar, Reagan mm-hmm. and Peyton are BFFs. <laughs> yes. They're best friends. That's Life how we all. friends. Yeah. Yes. And I think you and I probably got connected first and then I think Peyton hit me up. So yeah. um, cool to connect with some, you know, with people on, on the gram. So it's cool. Yeah, definitely. I love yep. it. So, okay. So t- tell us a little bit about yourself, how you grew up, where you grew up and the role that music played in your life. Um, music played a huge role. I did grow up in Nashville, uh, born and raised actually. And um, my parents, more so my dad than my mom, my dad's in the music industry. My mom's a hairdresser on Music Row. So she was just doing everybody's hair in the music industry. So they're both kind of in the industry. And my dad is just a lover of music. And um, like, we didn't watch movies as a kid. We barely games. We just like listen to records all the time. Um, on Sundays, my dad will wake us up by like blasting records and making waffles. And then we would go through his record collection and pick one. And then that's how we learned about all types of music, genres, all sorts of stuff. So um, music was always a big part of my life. Um, I even was started singing at six and writing songs at seven. And my dad said to me, oh, you know, that's great. You can sing it all, but you got to write your own songs if you want to be, you know, successful or a real artist. So at seven, I wrote my first song and I used someone else's melody. And he goes, well, that's great, but you got to write your own melodies too. Like, you know, how you talk to a seven-year-old. Um, so I've just been song- songwriting and singing ever since then. And it's just been like a constant through my life. That's so okay. So tell tell me a little bit about like that. I mean, writing a song at seven, even though you use someone else's melody, like like <laughs> it, it, it's really that's so. In, you know, you're kind of one of the first people I've ever talked to, or probably the first person I've talked to who your parents or your dad really just brought you into music. I mean, yeah, a lot of parents are you know wanting their kids to grow up and get a nine to five and be a doctor, or a lawyer, like or whatever it is, and your dad really really crafted you or you know he raised you to be a musician I mean yeah yeah I mean what was it like writing a song at seven like what did you even write about what were you talking about literally like lord knows I'm sure it was silly but Uh um I do remember (laughs) this is like low-key sad but you know musicians parents did divorce when I was around eight seven or eight so I was a very emotional little kid and I was going through a lot so I was writing kind of about that um but it really saved me because I had an outlet like immediately when I needed it um and always have used it as such um but it is funny right because our parents kind of just like teach us what they like and my dad just loved music so that's what he taught me and my brother my brother also writes and sings and plays guitar and um yeah it's it I feel so grateful that they've always supported my music they never pressured me to you know get like a corporate job or to get this or that or the other or go to school and they really kind of let us figure out what it is we wanted and just encouraged us you know, as long as we were working hard and we were going towards something, they didn't care what that was. Um, But yeah, it is very cool that my parents were fully supportive of the music for sure. Mm -hmm. And so when you started growing up, what, like, did you do like any other kind of music growing up, choir or singing in church or anything like that? Pretty much anything I could get my hands on, I did. Singing in church, choir, I was, I was so cool. I was president of the choir and vice president of the Thespian Society. Okay. And like team leader in the show choir. It was like a bit obnoxious. Um, but we had, I had so much fun. I loved, I, my favorite part of music is collaboration. So that's why I was always in a group, you know, chorus or theater or whatever it was. Um, and then also just like, you know, I always just play little shows around town. I grew up in a smaller town outside of Nashville. So the national anthem here, there, you know, random summer show here, there, 4th of July, things like that. Mm-hmm. Whatever that I did. What, what, what was the name of the town you grew up in? 
it's called Fairview. Fairview, Fairview. Okay. Well, what's it like growing up? What was it like growing up in Fairview? You said it's a small town. I mean, how many people live there? I think it's, it was 7,000. It's probably a little more than that now because mm -hmm. everything kind of outside of Nashville is blowing up. Um, but it was 7,000 when I was going to school there. I think I graduated like 140, which is, I think it's a pretty, I don't know if that's small or big, to be honest with you. It, pretty it, small. It was, okay. <laughs> yeah, it was a smaller school. Um, one thing that was cool about my school was I actually loved high school because it was so small. Everyone did everything. Like our quarterback was also like Daddy Warbucks and Annie. Um, <laughs> That's cool. And like we had cheerleaders and theater and like everyone just did everything because the school was so small. So there wasn't, in my opinion, there wasn't a lot of divided, you know, groups mm -hmm. or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed it. I definitely was, I think because I grew up in such a small town, I've felt so compelled to travel and to move. I moved to New York City a few years ago and I definitely wanted to see the world because it was so small. Like literally if you drive from one end to the other, all the way through, it'll take you 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I was ready to see more things for sure. Yeah. So I like where I grew up is, I mean, I'm in this town called Walnut Creek, which is like outside San Francisco. Everyone knows San Francisco, big town. Yeah. Walnut Creek is like 66,000. So it's bigger than where okay. you grew up. But even for yeah. us in the Bay area, that's a small town because the, wow. the Bay area, it's so right. populated. And so, if you know if you want to get somewhere that's like smaller than that you know you go north 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 northern california right. start getting into sonoma county which is where all the famous wine is made oh, yeah, you got yeah. Smaller, right. small, yeah you got smaller towns out there and so I, I i have this thing where like i guess technically i'm a city slicker because i grew up you know where i grew up but i have this right. affinity i have this affinity for small towns and like okay. i don't i don't know something about uh mm -hmm. I just really love the community aspect of a small town. I love local. I'm like so big on local. Right. Me too. Local everything. Yeah. My dad loves local music. You know, yeah. uh, I went to a school called Chico state. That's a small, well, no, see that's got 80,000 people, but they called it a small town and it's a college town, super okay. farm town country for California, uh, right. a lot of local music. So when my dad would come up to visit, he'd always be like, where's the local music? Where's the local concert? You know? So you know, it sounds like you guys had a, a local music scene and obviously you're near Nashville, which, you know, is categorized as the yeah. country capital of the world. What was it like right. up in that kind of music culture? Um, so there wasn't a huge music culture in my small town. It mm -hmm. was very much, you know, if there was something going on, they try to get some live music. But other than that, there, it wasn't a whole, whole lot going on. Um, but because we were so close to Nashville, it was one of those, like, everyone knew someone who knew someone who was... A, someone, I guess, yeah, in Nashville. Yeah. Um, but because my parents were in the industry, knew a lot more about the music industry than maybe your average, you know, person who isn't around Nashville or from a different small town. Um, my mom worked on Music Row as a hairdresser. So I was downtown a lot. Like I was on Music Row and I was always inspired by like all the signs. If you go, if you drive down Music Row, you see all the signs of congratulations to so-and-so on their number one. We just signed so-and-so. So it was always around and it was always a motivating thing to see it. And I started taking vocal lessons when I was like 16. And I was going down, I'd ride down to Music Row with my mom. I'd take the car, I'd go to my lesson, and then I'd go back and hang out with her at the salon. But that was just like, I felt like I was going in the right direction. And also my dad is a roadie. So I grew up like in arenas, like backstage, like seeing how the show and the process works so i've always had a very deep appreciation for like the men behind the man kind of thing and yeah. you know production and lighting and sound and everything that isn't just like the music on stage i've always been fascinated by all of that very interesting okay yeah so there's because there's a lot that goes on that's something people really don't understand about music is there's so much you know so much behind the scenes like you'll hear a song on spotify and the average listener just takes that song for what it is, but they don't really understand everything that goes on behind it. And, you know, right. you a concert and you just see this artist do their thing and you don't really understand that it's like, takes like a, you know, takes like an army to get that. An army. Right. There's like 70 people just crew alone behind that. And then, you know, all the stage hands, all the local people who work the show. Yeah. It's a, it's, it really is an army. Yeah. Well, what do you think about now with everything going on? You know, we have this, 
I don't want to talk too much about it, but the whole pandemic thing, we can't go do sure. live shows right now. And the music industry has obviously changed because we can't go do shows. What, what, what do you feel about like, I don't know, what do you think about where things are right now in terms of the climate of like the world with music? Uh, I do, I'll touch on this a little bit, but then I do have like a prediction. Um, okay. Obviously, like if you can support your, your favorite artists by actually buying their singles or their record on iTunes, that's going to be a lot more helpful than just streaming it. Um, you know, or like gifting something, some merchandise to someone for Christmas, like anything to like, you just like you'd help your local stores, like helping your local artists, your favorite people will help a lot as well for the people who are already you know, establish and tour and sell out stadiums and everything. Just, you know, it's something to keep in mind that, you know, those 70 people that are behind them that are on the crew are out of work as well right now. And it's not just like, I think a lot of people think the entertainment industry, it's like, well, they'll be fine. You know, the entertainment industry is full of money. Those people are full of money and they'll be fine. They'll just go back out on the road. But everyone who either works for them or is in the music business hasn't had work for a year and may not have work for another one or however long it'll take before people can go back out on tour. I'm um, just keeping that in mind, you know, when you're trying to support people. Um, but also I do have a prediction that when things, when people are able to tour again, when, when entertainment is accessible again, live entertainment, it's going to be like the next Renaissance. Like I have a feeling people are going to, go to whatever they can. They might be interested in new art forms that they've never seen before. Um, people are going to be creating art left and right, whether that's, you know, theater or dance, entertainment, putting out albums. I think it's going to be really fun and really cool to see what art comes out of all of this. We've already had a lot of good records come out this year, but I'll be really interested to see how the live entertainment industry works after this but I think it'll be fun. I think it'll be really cool. I do too. Yeah. I mean, I think concerts, um, traveling, you know, vaca I mean, people are going to go on a lot of vacations. I'm sure. Um, uh -huh. everything that was lacking, you know, if they're, you're able to stay afloat through all of this, um, yep. you're going to be in good shape at the end. So, right. okay. I love your prediction cause I'm totally trying to be optimistic too. And I, right. I love that kind of attitude. So, yeah. all right. So you're, you're, you've gone into music, right? And so you've been doing, so, well, let me ask you this, like you moved to New York. Like, I think you had told me about it when we last yeah. talked, but like just for the show, why did you move to New York? Um, well, if we want to get real, how, how real can we get on here? You can get, <laughs> however, yeah, your plat, this is your platform as much as it is mine's, whatever you want to say. It's all good. Okay. So, uh, I feel like a lot of people, when you are on a creative venture and you're going after something and I was very much hustling I was and like started, I think I had my first record done by the time I was 19. Like I was writing with people. I was working a lot as a waitress to pay to make a record, to pay the band, to pay like just to get it done. And you know, I made that record. I was writing, co-writing, working, playing shows, um, just hustling, you know, the grind. And, you know, I don't, I want to be careful saying this. I was doing publisher pitchers, pitches. I was getting any critique that I could from mentors, coaches. I had a lot of people in my life that I was seeking advice from. And it got to a point where I think, you know, I don't know if I was ready to hear everything or to put myself in a position to hear as much as I did uh, criticism. And I totally believe if you're trying your best and you're working hard and you're honing in on your craft with authenticity, you will get where you need to go. You will grow, you will get better and you can't expect to be the best when you're, when you're new at something or when you're very young or you haven't had a lot of hours behind you yet. Mm -hmm. So I was seeking advice and I was seeking critiques, but to a point where I was like drowning in critiques and it wasn't fun anymore. It wasn't fun to create anymore. It wasn't, this is over like a five year period, by the way, I stayed in, I moved to New York when I was 20, I was, tw I turned 22 there the month I moved. So I guess like five years, give or take of just hustling, seeking out opportunities. And I did just get burnt out. I got a little jaded with the industry. Um, so yeah, I was like, I'm going to quit music. I'm going to quit songwriting. 
Um, it's not fun for me anymore. I've always loved theater. Like I've always loved different art forms, dance, theater, mm -hmm. script writing. So I was like, I'm going to go to New York. I'm going to do acting classes, dancing classes. And I did. And I had no intention of songwriting ever again, to be honest. I was like, if I'm meant to, it'll happen. So I went to New York and I'm so glad I did because it shifted my perspective on craft and authenticity as an artist. And I got up to New York and I was loving acting. I was loving dancing. I was learning new things. And I got to a point where I was like, man, I really want to sing. I really want to write a song. And I just got to a point where I was just missing it so much. It's like, that's all I want to do is sing. Uh, I loved acting and I love dancing. And I think the more you learn about different art forms, they help your art form. They're all kind of connected in some ways, but I really truly missed expressing myself by singing and songwriting. So I did come back to Nashville working on another project that's almost done. And now I have a much well-rounded view of art in general and um, everything I learned in New York, I just apply. And I've kind of learned my lessons that I got away from. Like the reason I ran away from Nashville, I kind of learned my lessons on those. So now I'm in a much better place create, creatively as an artist, as a musician. Um, and I enjoy it again. <laughs> I do love it. Even that's though awesome. I did that at some point. That's so interesting. So I, I, you know, I went through similar times too. I think every, every musician who's been doing it for a long time must go through that yeah. jaded phase. The word jaded really hit me when you said that, because that's, I went through same thing, you know, um, feeling like, you know, things aren't going, it, it comes from this place. I feel like it comes from a place of like, things just aren't going the way you want them to go. And right. you have these expectations for yourself and, and stuff just isn't going that way. And how did you, so yeah. I, I would love to dive deep into the I'm all about like the mental stuff. Like I'm sure you are too. So oh, where, yeah, me too. what was that mental place for you? Like what you said, you heard, a, you heard all these critiques yeah. and that kind of started leading to getting jaded, right? Like yeah. what was the mental path for you to go from all these people are critiquing me yeah. and then like, I'm just over it. Like, what was that like? I, I, I'm really glad you said this because I wanted to touch back on it, especially Granted, most when I was 18 and 19, I did not want to hear this. I thought I knew everything. I And I was super independent, and I, I was smart for my age, like not as naive as I could have been. But I just want to mention, like, be very careful of who you're seeking advice from. Mm. Do Is their life what you want? Because <sighs> there are so many people in these entertainment cities mm -hmm. that – love to give advice to young people and love to critique and they may have not had much success at all yeah. i always say if you're seeking out a coach or you're seeking out a mentor their life should look like what you want yours to look like yeah. and if not take everything with a grain of salt so i was getting a lot of advice and critiques from people who were i so i'll explain my method methodology i have like a circle of people who I know are real deal. I've kind of been in this industry kind of long enough now, especially because I grew up around it to know what real deal is. And real deal to me are people who are very hardworking, very humble, who are very dedicated to their craft, who don't just give out free advice and not free, that might be a bad word, but aren't just like willing to give out all this advice. If they're not asked for it. If someone's giving you advice and you did not ask for it, there's a red flag. Mm. If you're putting yourself in rooms with publisher meetings and they're critiquing you, that's a different story. Um, but yeah, overall, just like be very wary of who you are seeking advice from. I was at a point where it was just all critique, all almost negative, just all negativity, not a lot of positivity, not a lot of encouragement. And if you're going to seek out that much critique, be sure that you are seeking out encouragement as well. You have to have a balance. Like we can take on all of the critique in the world to make us better, but you have to be filling your own cup up so you can withstand. Um, I've had some amazing teachers who were very hard on me, but they taught me why it was so important for the craft and how to fill myself back up. So um, I don't even remember what your question exactly was. No, you <laughs> off a no. tangent there <laughs> no i'm glad no now you got me thinking we're so on the same page about stuff because i when i first started with music i was you know i started taking it seriously when i was 17 years old and mm -hmm. I, I asked for critiques and so all my friends 
um, man, if they didn't critique me the way they did, I wouldn't be where I'm at. They really, mm-hmm. and I wanted them to, and they went a little, they went harder, like with the critiques on purpose and I didn't take it bad at all. But then later, and so I knew the difference between that. That was good critiques, even though they weren't in a position I wanted to be in, but they yeah. told me, Hey, we're just going to listen to it and compare your music to like Drake and J Cole. So if you're not at that level, we're going to compare it to that. I said, great. I love that. Yeah. And it helped. And it was my friends. They loved me and I love them back. So I knew what that was like, but then I, I started noticing that same thing when people start critiquing you and you just kind of know where it's coming from. And yeah. Yeah, if they don't ask, if you don't ask them and they just kind of tell you, and then it gets like that, not just with music, that's where I learned it, but from life. And we'll talk about your other stuff you do too, but Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Like with exercise from, I could go through so many stories, but like with exercise, for me, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm like very serious about exercise and about certain habits that I have. And, uh, like when I tell, when people ask, Hey, like, like this year I went through a big transformation. I lost 30 pounds this year and it was fucking amazing. Oh, wow. Congrats. Everybody awesome. was like, what'd you do? And I, I don't know why people ask me that because I, I, I don't know if they're, they're never ready to hear the answer. Cause I'll tell them what I did and yeah. they'll be like, they'll just say, they'll give an excuse. Sometimes, sometimes people say, wow, I'm impressed. Or sometimes they'll go, Oh, you drink a gallon of water? Like, you know, that's not good for you. You could drown if you drink too much water. I'm like, dude, you can't, <laughs> you can't though. Or you know, or like, oh, you you work out that much? Like, you could really hurt your joints if you. It's just this, blah blah shit. And I and I just was like, dude, you know what? Like, that's the reason you're asking me what I did, right? right? And so yeah. it gets like, it's that with just like money, success, like oh, what yeah. you. Should, you know what I mean? And it's funny because people give me advice. I go, well, you don't do a podcast every day. So why the fuck should I listen to what you're talking about? So what, what do you like? Talk about life shit. Like, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, um, I'm trying to remember the exact quote cause it's so good, but it's like, it was like some quote. If anybody wants to go find it, I love Liz Gilbert. She wrote big magic. That book changed my life, but it's something she says about free advice, Okay. but it's so true. You know, like, you could be talking about anything. You could be talking about a, you could be talking to a good friend about a struggle, mm-hmm. and if they start giving you advice that you didn't ask for, be wary of that. Like I know, like it's your friends and maybe it's a family member, but and especially like older people in the entertainment industry love to saturate you with advice. This is how I did it. Da 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 da. And right. the thing about any creative journey in all industries, it it never goes the same way for everyone. Everyone has a different path. No one could replicate the same thing someone else did and it worked for them. The create, you can't do that with creativity. You have to carve your own path and figure out what works for you. Um, and you know, just like I received some advice in a class that said, um, a producer who was pretty successful. He had a couple Grammys and everything. And he said, you can either sleep or be successful. And I took that very literally, ended up in the hospital twice that year. Oh. Uh, was not taking care of myself, like literally like months without a day off, like a real one, a real day off. And right. um, I took that advice apart because I was like, oh, I want to be successful. I have to do everything it takes. And now mm. I am a, I'm a life coach and I've had a very long journey with wellness. Not super long, but I'm only 24. But <laughs> Um, I've had a pretty extensive journey with wellness up until this point, And I realized what works for me is rest and refueling yeah. so that I can create good work. Cause back then I was creating quantity over quality. I was writing probably five songs a week, but they were probably all shit, you know? And now I write yeah. maybe one song a week and it's probably a lot better. Um, I'm big on quality over quantity at this point. And, you know, taking care of yourself, filling up your cup so you can create more work and you can hone in on your craft that I think pays off more in the long run. You know, I totally agree. That's so, inter- yeah, I went through uh similar where it's like, you feel like, you know, you can't take a day off. I, I, I got that a lot from like, from like listening to Gary V, you know, I got into yeah. him and, and he has that, he talks about that. And um, I think that I got deep when I got deeper into his stuff, I realized he's just kind of saying what he did. He's not saying what like you should do. And he only, the other thing too, is I had to realize that what he was talking about was, this is why people got to be really careful when they, again, listen to advice or when they hear, yeah. you know, some icon on social media, he wasn't really talking to me. Cause I'm, you know, I'm not, yeah. he's talking to people who complain about their life and who like yeah. are, you know, throwing pity parties for themselves. But I thought he was talking to me cause I didn't get it, you know? So I was like, okay, yeah. same thing. And 
Yeah, I would like – I, I used to not sleep a lot just because I would stay up late, screwing off, and yeah, just yeah. whatever, you know. And now I've realized, like, you know, kind of like that rest and recovery, but my own way, I call it – it's like active recovery, you know, maybe – yeah. You just exercise, read a book, like work on music for fun, not just right. for work. And that to me yeah. is recovery, you know, and music's not work for me. Music's super fun. So I, if I can take a day where I'm just making beats with, I don't know what's going to happen or, Hey, I'm just going to turn the mic on and record. That is recovery for me mentally. Right. So right. it's not realistic to, to, to say 24, seven, seven days a week. But if, but if you're the type of person that complains and mm -hmm. doesn't like their life, well then yeah, you, you I don't know. I think still, but it's like, yeah, the whole like grind all day is only for people who hate where they're at so much and they're so sad and sorry. It's like, all right, well then, yeah, you should probably get to it. I mean, what do you think of that? Yeah. Oh, I totally agree. And I love what you said. Of You have to realize that he wasn't talking to you. Right. Um, so, you know, I think we all have idols. We all have people we look up to. And when we see successful people, we do want to buy their book or we do want to listen to their podcasts and hear what they have to say, but always, you know, apply it to your life that you're living. Don't just try to start living their life because mm. they're in a very different place than you. And mm. you are maybe starting at mile one. They're probably on mile like 700. So <laughs> comparison is just, there's no point. There's no point in comparing yourself to people who are already so far ahead of you. Like you, you're putting your work in, they're still putting their work in. You're at this place and they're at this place. Um, but you know, the whole concept of wellness with art, um, mm. I, you, in the world that we are in now, especially America, if you go overseas, you know, between three and five, they're having a glass of wine, smoking a cigarette on a patio. Like they don't give a fuck. Like they're not grinding. Like we are, it's very hustle mentality in America. And, um, I think a lot of us artists, creatives have adapted the hustle mentality but it doesn't do much for us at all you know like burning the candle at both ends and trying to make great art is very it's very counterproductive in my opinion sometimes it works for people like even if like you're one of those who like stay up all night you're right you like got a whim of inspiration and you stay up till three in the morning working on something like i hope you're resting the next day um because we can only go so long before we just burn out and yeah. artists are constantly you know my clients are constantly talking to me about burnout 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 it's like well of course we're burnout like we're working 40 hours a week we are 20 to 30 hours a week in a side hustle we're trying to do this on the side people have children and families to take care of like of course we're burnout if you don't if you want to avoid burnout you have to take care of yourself and you have to prioritize wellness um, whatever that looks like for you. I love said active recovery because there's an intention behind it. Yeah. Like sometimes recovery does look like, you know, catching up on Netflix and resting and like sitting on a couch chilling, yeah. but active recovery, when you have an intention behind your recovery, it's going to take you so far and get you to recover a lot faster. I love that. I'm going to steal that if you don't mind. Take it. No, I took <laughs> it from someone else. Well, I had heard it in the sense of exercise active recovery where instead of just not moving your body you do for you what would be considered a light workout which for me you walk around the block right so that would be an active recovery uh mm -hmm. you know and 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 for me um you know that it's that concept of right if we're talking sense of exercise let's say i run uh five miles a day let's say i i do that i don't but let's say i did five miles a day and that was like really you know my my challenge that would be really hard um, <clears throat> on an active recovery day, I might, I might run one mile in the morning and then at night walk, that would be right. So <clears throat> okay. with my, with the hustle stuff, with the, I don't know how else to say it, the business stuff, the music career, right. it's, you know, it's like, I have a lot on the, <laughs> I put a lot on my plate. Um, uh, so like on an active recovery day, like I said, it'll be, you know what, let's turn the computer on, let's turn on logic pro and let's just see what happens. Like just yeah. have some fun, go play, play. Right music um hey, yes <laughs> yeah go play it's still pretty productive though right like it's still good for my brain you know and i don't um <clears throat> i don't promote like uh, i think everybody does their thing however they want i don't really do i don't smoke i don't really drink i have like a beer sometimes but i don't really yeah. do all that you know so i'm not big on promoting that kind of stuff uh and like 
you know, the Netflix time, if you need it. I mean, I watched Netflix last night for about 40 minutes. It was great. Right. You know, so I do that too. Um, what, how do you recover? What's your, like, how do you stay balanced and what do you do? Yeah. If I, I call them my emotional or reset days. Um, my go-to is hiking, like taking a walk in the woods. Nice. Um, sometimes I, I, and I don't listen to anything and I just kind of let my mind wander. Sometimes if I want to like fill my cup up or get inspired, I'll listen to a podcast or an audio book while I'm walking. Um, it's really good like to process ideas and emotions in motion. Um, I learned that from it's in the second artist way the artist way changed my life and i did the second one julia cameron and then she adds in you have an artist day you have morning pages and a weekly walk but i walk as much as i can um i try to get in the woods um i also will do like a yoga practice meditation helps um journaling is a huge thing for me i try to journal every day mm -hmm. um you know like a, a bath is great um very small things so what i try to tell people is like you don't have to spend a lot of money. Like you don't have to go to a spa or go on a vacation to reset, like just small decisions throughout the week or the day to kind of like balance your energy or balance what you're going through or, you know, we just run ourselves ragged. So that's what I do. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I do. Oh, like you said, I love that you said play because we forget like, we play music, right? Like right. we don't work music. We play music. Like That's we have right. taken the play out of it by yeah. hustling. So I'm like you, like I'll just like, sometimes if I really need like a reset, I will just sit at the piano. No expectations. I'm not trying to practice. I'm not trying to whatever. I'll just play. And maybe something will come to me. Maybe it doesn't. Or I also paint and I'll just go to the canvas and try something new I've never done before. Um, I love that you said play because we are, artists especially full-time artists who are like trying to make money off of their art and their, they, that is their business they also have to have a hobby too an outlet because once you're out most of us music started as an outlet once your outlet becomes your business you still have to have another outlet like yeah. pick up a different hobby try something else out i know most like entertainers that i've been around do have like a little side hobby like musicians pick up photography or they pick up something else um so yeah, it's very important to still have fun at what you do. <laughs> totally. It's really hard. It's very, you know, and what, what really helped me with the having fun part was having those other things. Like I always in my head, I was like, dude, okay, I always want my brand. I always think brand, like I want my brand to move forward. I want to grow an audience. Yeah. Like I want to, I want to see things happening and I realize, okay, music is not the only way for you to grow that. Like, you know, for me, it's this right. podcast thing. Right. And so I love podcasting so easy. Like it's way easier than music. Like I'm just talking, it's complete freestyle. Um, there's no mixing and yeah. mastering. Like it's so, and I can collaborate if yeah. I want with people like you, right. or I could just do it by my, it doesn't matter. And it's great. Right. You know, just put it out every day. And I'm like, dude, this is getting me further along in my brand than right. the amount of work I was putting into music. So just don't put the, I just, I took the pressure off the songs itself and realized it's not the only thing that pushes your music brand forward. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yes. And most like you found another creative outlet yeah. to help your brand. That's just, that's besides your creative outlet. Um, in big magic, Liz Gilbert talks about, she's said, she's been writing since she was like 12 and she promised her craft, she would never put the burden of money on her craft. Like mm. she was like, I'll never try to purposely make money off of writing. Um, I will find other ways to to survive and take care of my craft versus having my craft take care of me. And that is what made me fall in love with music again. When I stopped putting the expectation of dollar signs on mm. my art, I got to have fun again. Um, and like you said, like finding something else you enjoy just to survive and then you can grow in all sorts of ways. Like your podcast, you are going to be meeting so many people that you then will maybe collaborate with or will see your music. Like it's such a smart idea and we all can do that. Like we can, we're all creatives. We can get outside of the box and think of what else we can do that's 
besides just the art itself. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. Yeah. Can we talk about this whole month? I want to talk about this though, the whole money Mm -hmm. associated with the music thing, because I'm even still kind of struggling with it in a way I've gotten a lot better at it, but I do want my music to pay me. Like I want to make money off of my music, but for some reason I'm not letting it. I'm, I'm, I'm very much doing what Liz, Liz Gilbert is that what her name is. Yeah. Uh -huh. I'm doing what she said. I'm not le like when I'm in the studio, I'm like, bro, whatever, like whatever happens, yeah. happens. Like let's bring okay. people. I don't care. But I also do want my music to make me money. So how, what do you, how's that balance like, work out? Let, I, I want to ask you a question. So I feel like you were about to say, but does something, something, something. So you said you want to make money off music, but you are in a space where you're letting the music come to you yeah. and you're not like putting the burden on it, but blank. Uh, but like, I don't know. I, I just feel like I'm contradicted with the idea because it's so like, I don't know. I, I, I just, I kind of feel like it's a dichotomy. I feel like it's not so cut and dry. I feel like people are either one way or another, or like they think that the idea is one way or another. They think like, Hey, if you get paid or if you're focused on getting paid, it ruins the art. Uh -huh. um, and then the opposite is if you just don't let money get in the way, then blah, blah, blah. But, but I don't know. I just, I, I just am like, I don't think it's so, I think like the literal spiritual right. essence of that concept is not so black and white. I think there's, I think yeah. like, cause see, I don't believe, see that's well, so that gets into a deeper thing like mm -hmm. money, like what is really money then? Cause I have a great positive energy around money. Like I think money yeah. is like good. So, yeah. What's your stance on like money in relation to creativity? Okay. So I'll start by saying I have also had a journey with money and learning that money is energy. Energy is currency. So let's not forget that sometimes it's not all about the dollar. It's about the exchange of goods. Let's just put it simply. Okay. So sometimes putting your art out into the well, isn't going to get you back dollar signs, but it's going to get you back something, an opportunity, another opportunity to maybe make money. Um, and also I've had to go through a journey of, you know, money is bad, starving artist mentality, blah, 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 to a, we can have abundance as artists that looks like abundance to us. Um, I kind of started this journey. Um, my little spiritual gurus, Liz Gilbert, uh, Julia Cameron, um, these books I've read, have kind of shaped my opinion of artistry and money to become what I believe is if you hone in on your craft and you are authentic and you keep at it, something good will come to you. Mm. Um, I've heard from so many people in town and Nashville songwriters, like everyone gets a run. Your run may not be as long as others, mm -hmm. but if you keep at it, you will get, everyone gets a run. Right. So that may not always look like don't, so that may look like an opening act they might look like a lead in a show um and as artists you know i feel like from our soul those are the things we actually want we need money to survive so you know like i said getting outside of the box getting creative with is for money to come to you um it's creating that space in that time to receive what the universe wants to give you. I know I'm getting like super abstract here. This is what uh, I like. Okay. Um, I was trying to, what was your other question? How did you phrase that question? Cause I'm kind of all over the map here. I have lots of opinions on money with art and I think. I love it. No, we're, we're just talking. Very well. <laughs> yeah, no, well you're talking about, you're talking about, uh, you're talking about like currency and like the spirituality of like, you know, um, money and like what it can what it can do for you and mm -hmm. it really seems like a lot of a lot of us especially in the music world have kind of like i'm like like, like we've lost our way with what we really want i feel like okay. getting down to a nitty-gritty marketing aspect of it like if i'm gonna turn on my business brain you know yeah um, well the business brain and the spiritual brain are like that to me i mean because artists talk a lot about like you know I'm going to just draw a parallel here. Like artists really care about Spotify mm -hmm. plays and streams and playlists and mm -hmm. Instagram followers. Right. Yep. So we think that's what's important. And 
you know, I just had an artist call me two days ago, one of my friends, and he's like, Hey, like, I need some help. Like, I want to get on Spotify playlist. So I told him, and then I was like, Well, what do you really want though? He's like, He, I, I, he just, I was like, Do you, don't you want to make money? As like, don't you want to make money? He's like, Oh, yeah, of course. It's like, Okay, well, then why are you, why would you spend money on something and you don't know how that money's going to come back to you? Cause that's not mm -hmm. what businesses do. Businesses don't do that. Right. And he's like, uh, and I'm like, dude, cause you're not a rapper anymore. You're a business. Like I have to, everybody I talk to every musician, I go, dude, the first thing you got to know that this is going to be the most helpful sentence is you're not an artist. You're a business. And now you, you mm -hmm. are more than just that. And so it's the same thing with human beings outside of music yeah. and money. It's like, dude, yep. you're, why, why this negative, I asked one of my best friends recently, what do you feel about money? He's like, I need it. I was like, yeah, okay. Do you want it? And he's like, I don't want money. I need money. I go, your perspective is fucked up, dude. Ah. Like he wrote all, we wrote all of his goals down. And I was like, every single goal on here can't happen unless you have a fuckload of money. Like all these big goals <laughs> you have, you, you yeah. can't do it if you're having trouble at the grocery store. I said, right. you better start fucking wanting money. So we talked yeah. about it. He pushed his brain up. But so yeah. I don't, what, where did that come from in society? This whole negative shit on money. Like, where do you think it came from? Um, I, okay. I have lots of thoughts. I wrote something down. I saw you writing it down too. I was like, hi, I I was like, that's the first time in my <laughs> podcast history. Someone grabs a pen and start writing. I was like, oh, this is about to get real. I love that. That is like me to a T. Like I will, if I have to say something, I will write it down. Okay. So money with regular, like normal human relationships with money. Yeah. Um, yeah. well, if you think about it, where we're at right now, most of us were raised by people who had grandparents in the Great Depression, okay? Mm. So my dad is a boomer. <laughs> His parents were in the Great Depression. Yep. Very scarcity mindset. Right. Um, that trickles down through the family, right? Um, some families, like if, you, if your parents have like a great relationship with money and their mindset is awesome with money, you are probably more likely to have a relationship with money because you were taught that a lot of us were not taught that and it's not their fault like they were literally raised by people who grew up in the great depression um so it's a very scarcity mindset um and i think that's just kind of where we are as a society right now um the point i wanted to make about artists was that the starving artist concept has literally been around since the renaissance right like starving artists you know they're not the ones who are rich. It's the kings and they do things for the kings and for the community and everything. Um, and my point on that, oh my gosh, my mind. Um, I wanted to say, see, this is why I write things down. No, it's okay. all, it's all Playing good. for free, playing for free. Gotcha. Okay. So um, I don't know how much different. I'm pretty sure in New York, the pay is better. I don't know how it is in LA. I'm just like thinking of the creative cities in the US. But in Nashville, there's the demand for entertainment is so low. Venues don't have to seek out artists. Artists are seeking out venues. So venues don't really, most venues don't pay around here. Um, and when you play for free long enough, it's kind of this mental mind fuck that your craft or your art is not worth it. It's not worth the. That's what it's worth. Free, right? It's free. So, and then granted, the other opportunity of playing for free is more exposure, or maybe people go out and they just make tips, and they do make. Some people do. I know people that make their living literally off of tips, but most of the venues around here don't pay, and I know it messes with your mindset. It messes with mine. And it messes with all of my friends. Yeah. All of us have this weird thing of asking people for money like i'm going to play a show i'm going to give you a service four hours of time and energy and work and weeks of practice that went into this why do i feel weird about asking to be paid yeah. like what like <laughs> a landscaper would never go mow someone's lawn for four hours and then feel weird about asking to be paid right. um i think it's just this weird place that we're in especially in nashville as a town um and especially with spotify because again people aren't being paid that much so it's just like in musicians heads all the time that we just don't deserve to be paid as much as a nine to five job or any mm. other type of art form um and so yeah that's kind of 
I don't know exactly if that answers your question. No, it does. It totally That's does. That's where I, I think it comes from. Yeah, I think part of that has to do with just our value. No, that's so true. Like our value, like we feel like, because business is predicated on a business provides value to someone in exchange for, you know, money. And we as artists really feel like, I felt like this too. We feel like we don't, our music doesn't have value that relates to money. And I actually, it's very interesting how this year, 2020, that was really my mindset. So I went Mm. from being an artist, right? And then the pandemic happened and I was like, wait, I'm not going to tour. I want to get money right now. I don't know when I'm going to get money. I'm going to switch it up and be a producer selling beats where there's like a very clear value of what you're doing for people. So I was really focused on that until recently. uh, And I have a mentor now who's explained to me, well, there is value in music. Like, don't you have music that you value? And I was like, well, of course. He's like, don't you have artists who you've bought from or who you would buy from if they offered a good enough offer to you? I was like, well, yeah. They're like, well, the problem is you don't see this because artists in the industry don't give out offers that are Mm -hmm. very enticing. I was like, oh, what do you mean? He's like, well, artists just, they just put their music out on Spotify, YouTube, this, that, and then they do tours. But like, if we're talking in a sense of related to like online marketing and like online business, which I have not, not an expert, but I'm pretty well versed in what that looks like. He's like, dude, Drake, Kevin Gates, all these artists who you like, they don't have sales funnels. They don't give you offers that are enticing to you, do they? I was like, no, they don't. He's like, well, if they did, you'd buy it. I was like, oh shit. Like if Drake, like I, I have this idea for Drake where if he had a documentary yeah, and only put it out for purchase, you had to pay 50 bucks, but it came with all, like all these free bonuses and behind the scenes and all his music, yeah. I would, I'd buy, he'd make right. 50 million off that for right. sure. He'd get a million people to buy that. If you put something like that together and framed it on a web page that was laid mm-hmm. out like a funnel, if he, dude, it would be, he'd easily make 50 million in a week. No, no question about it. Um, that he could own. And, but they don't do that. That's not how music works. Music industry is like, you need, ma- you need to get paid off streaming and which to get really paid, you need these massive numbers. And then yes. it's just this whole direct to consumer thing. Now there are plenty of artists out there who sell music direct to consumer. But yes. they don't have massive numbers. They're not right. famous. Uh, so, and they don't care about being famous, right? I mean, mm-hmm. so, right. you know, last thing I'll say, and then I'll ask you this, but like just as a numbers breakdown, for example, mm-hmm. there's an artist I really like named Ryan Leslie, and he's a rapper and a, he's a producer. And then he uh-huh. started rapping, right? He was signed, um, you know, he was, he, was uh, he, he produced for Cassie. She had that song, Me and You, like a long time uh-huh. ago. He produced her whole album. She went, number one in eight different countries and he produced her music. So that's kind of how he got his start. He got in the industry. He was signed though. Then he was like, I'm going to go indie. Um, And basically he, he has um, all of his customers in a texting platform where he does text message marketing. He owns his own platform called smartphone.io that he created where it's text message marketing, but he's got only 40 only. And I say only in a funny way, he only has 40,000 customers, 40,000 fans where if you look on instagram if someone's got 40k that's not a lot 40k monthly listeners that's not a lot but he has 40,000 people who buy so he put out an album um 40,000 people spent 10 bucks okay 400 grand but then he went on tour around the world and 40,000 people spent 40 dollars which is 1.6 mil so he made two mil off an album that he owns the masters to and the publishing and he gets to keep so that's kind of, but nobody knows about that. Like I'm telling you about it and that's yeah. news to you. It was news to me. It's news to right. everybody I tell, but that's yeah. so much more impressive than mm-hmm. any other big artist going out there. So there is a value. I mean, what's, let me ask you, like, what do you, first of all, what are your thoughts? And then what, what's the value that yeah. music is in your life that you feel like you could bring to yeah. My first thought when you were telling me about that was, I imagine that's also a very pleasant experience for the consumer. Right. Because they feel more of a connection and there's more of a relationship there with their, one of their favorite artists. I can, I, I, that's how I would feel if one of my favorite artists did that. Yeah. Um, my value for music, like, and this is the thing, like I try to explain this to people, right? Like you're going to go like pay 
to go see someone, right? You're going to see someone play. You're going to go pay to watch a movie. You're going to pay for your, you know, you know, a painting on your wall. There's value in all of this art. We've had art as long as we've had humanity, you know, art mimics humanity and humanity mimics art. Like it's always been around. Um, music in my life, like literally like it's that moment, like, this is how I define my relationship with music. It's that moment when, like, I have my sad song playlist on in the driveway, and I don't want to get out of the car because I just want to feel, I just want to feel this music and feel it's my safe space, you know, where I can process thoughts and emotions and feel like someone else understands or feel that empathetic voice, you know, and it, it just creates this, like, I call it like a blanket, like the Civil Wars is one of my favorite duos of all time. And when I listen to their records in my car, it's like a blanket over me. Um, hmm. But I, I really couldn't put a price on it because I've had so much human connection because of music, whether that's relationships with people and us like singing in the car to our favorite playlist, my dad teaching me about his favorite artists is me and my dad have, he's like my best friend. And like, that is because of music. You know, like I always say like fathers and sons like bonded over sports and my dad and I got to bond over music. That's why we are so close. So, you know, in the family dynamic, you can bond over music. When you're out at a festival and you make lifelong friends, you're bonding over music. So there is so much value in the experience of music, listening to music, going to see music, making music for me, especially has been, you know, my outlet since I was seven. And um, it, I really can't put a price on it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just, it's silly to think that there is no value in that. And that as a musician, you don't have value in your art because clearly we can see how much value art has yeah. since day one, since the earth was created. So, you know, absolutely. And, and my, my, my goal is one of my newer goals is <clears throat> my, my goal is, uh, uh, I, I, I want to, I want to create a legacy, right? That's like one of the things I want to do. And I want to create um, an impact and I'll just be open. It's a self-centered intention. I want to just feel cool. Like obviously <laughs> I want to feel powerful, but the way I can see myself doing that is, is by having this kind of conversation with like as many artists as possible and doing it on that Gary V scale that major yeah. like, no, this is what you should do. And, you know, my goal is to shut the music industry down, you know, and, 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 not shut Burn. it down, but re, <laughs> not, not shut it down, shut down the conventional and rebirth the music, yeah. industry, our new renaissance of the music uh, industry yes. where artists control themselves. And, you know, um, and I know my steps are, I have to do it first for myself. Like I can't go talk about it and just share examples unless I do it. So I want to get to that point where I do it for myself, create that living and then get to a point where I'm coaching or creating a course mm -hmm. or just literally talking about it on the podcast for free. So that's kind of where, that's where my head is going at, where I want to get to that point and continue I to build that. that, yeah, that personal, what, what's like, what are your, what are your goals? What are you trying to set out to do with music, life coaching, everything? I've just kind of gotten to a place where I want to live a creative life. Like, and my happy, my average day would be jumping from project to project to project, like having like maybe me coaching someone and being a part of their then going to work on my own project, then maybe another project. Um, just being surrounded by creatives, by art constantly. Um, and then I really just appreciate wellness and creativity together. Um, so this could look like, you know, I would love to do like wellness creative retreats one day. I love to travel. I'd love to take people on like a tour to these museums in Italy. And then we can talk about meditation and creativity. Um, I would love to eventually creative coaching my coaching brand to be a platform that can help creatives, no matter what their price point is, whether that's one on one, -on -one coaching videos, of course, you know, even getting in a space where, you know, like a theater company or a dance company, or maybe a crew on the road would be able to have experiences together, team building, something like executive coaching, but for, artistic environments, um, like bringing a coach into a company and working on the group dynamic, everyone's goals, the group goals, personal goals, things like that. Um, just on a more like emotional scale, 
Um, I just kind of have trust in the universe that, you know, the art I'm putting out, all I want for my personal art is it to have an impact on someone or for someone to feel empathy through my music or someone to have a good time, like dancing to my music, just, you know, some type of expression they can feel. Um, and I would love to play for people and have that relationship with them in a live dynamic, but overall just connecting with creatives, helping creatives get to where they want to go, you know, help, helping people who don't even consider themselves creatives to have a creative life and realize that it is accessible to them and having a creative hobby on the side enriches your life so much more than you would ever know. Um, just anything surrounding that, like the warm, fuzzy feelings of creativity, but also helping people get where they need to go, making their businesses impactful. Um, that's kind of where I want to go. That's like my goals for my life is just to constantly be creative, be working with creatives and helping people get to where they want to go. That's amazing. I love, I love that. that. That fires me up. Who, who is it that, who is it that you want to serve? Like who, I mean, I always ask people like, who's your ideal customer? Who's your ideal client? Like who's your dream like person? Yeah. I, I feel like I already have some of my dream clients, like people who are very passionate very self-aware and in tune with who they are and what their authenticity is and what their craft is and just helping them get like through these blocks and resistance and limiting beliefs so they can thrive and like getting like some people some of us are still so ingrained in the starving artist mindset that we really have to like kick those doors down um so helping people who are already so passionate just get further along in their career financially abundantly and you know abundance isn't all just money abundance is experiences it's time it's freedom um but also i have a huge like heart string for people who maybe are just like have kids and they don't have time to do anything for themselves and they just want to create maybe an hour a week um just helping them prioritize that and you know there's a lot of guilt around prioritizing yourself when you already have a family to take care of. Um, but cutting through those limiting beliefs and helping people see how amazing it is and how much it impacts you of your impacts your life to have a creative hobby or to have a creative passion, even if it's not for the world, even if it's just for you, you know, so that's, that's what gets me jazz. That's what gets me fired up. <laughs> I can talk about it for days. I love that. that. That's great. I mean, let me, so let me ask you this. Do you have like, do you have int it seems like you have some kind of interest in like the entrepreneurial like vibe. Yeah. What yeah. where where did you get introduced to like just that that whole world of like kind of being your own boss, you know, not working for someone and having that attitude? Well, where it started, I always wanted to be a boss. I always wanted to be a leader because my dad has worked for some incredible entertainers. And I have heard stories my whole life of what they've done for their crews. And this is not every entertainer. This is like a select few who are genuinely amazing people. And when I heard about what they did for their crew and how devoted they were to team, giving back, you know, using their platform for good, I've, it's just like ingrained in me to have always wanted to be that. And I thought I was going to get that through music. Like I thought, oh, I'll be an entertainer too. And then I'll take care of a band and a crew. Um, like I've always just wanted to like, like not take care of it. I mean, I am like very maternal. I'm a cancer. Like taking care of people is like something that is in my nature, but you know, just really be a good leader. Um, but then I got introduced to the world of business and entrepreneurship and started following some other really amazing leaders and their company COOs and realize you can do the same thing. It doesn't matter what your platform is or who your team is. You'd be a great team leader or a great CEO of whatever your company is. Um, but yeah, I've just always had that desire to really take care of a team and to be a part collaborating. You know, that's why I do what I do. I love collaborating, sitting in my room by myself. Singing is like one thing. Collaborating really gets me jazzed. Um, so that's kind of where I got so into entrepreneurship because I realized it's not just the music industry. It's like, it's all forms of business that you can access that. Right. Um, who are some of the people that you're into that you follow? I mean, you talked about who was it before you just tell, yeah. Who are some of the people that you're into? Um, so I just started listening to the story brand podcast with Donald Miller. And I just like, I literally finished, I got his audiobook and I finished it in a week. And 
he is real deal. Like we were talking about those real deal people earlier. Like he is so real deal. Um, I feel like you can just hear his intentions through what he's doing. Um, who else? Um, Brene Brown. I, I love Brene Brown. I know she like runs her own company and team, but I think she's just doing so much good for the world. I mean, Liz Gilbert, I've mentioned many, many times. Um, who else am I like obsessed with? And then like also like artists to a capacity, like entertainers, um, you know, who I've heard of taking care of their crews and people who are idols to me. Mm. Um, that's kind of all I'm, I can think of at the exa- at this moment. I'm kind of drawing a blank. But those people, I've literally kind of, they are like my my wise men. Like I go to them, I listen to their podcasts, yeah. I li- read their books for advice and inspiration. And I kind of model my life by that. When you have somebody like that, who you really look up to, what, it, like, what are some aspects of them that really draws you to them? You know, one thing that one thing I always admire is when people do prioritize taking care of themselves because I just didn't for so long when someone, when I see someone creating so well and creating such good art so authentically and they prioritize their health and mental health and well being, that really resonates with me because now I see how much they coincide and now I see how important it is. You know, creating is from the soul, you know, making art is from the soul. So if you're not even paying attention to your soul because you don't want to, because there's so much going on in there, I just don't know how the art could really come from that place if you're not taking care of it. Um, so there's that. Also, um, it really boils down to like how authentically their craft is. Like I can, I can smell a bullshitter from a mile away yeah. and I can tell when it's not authentic and when it's not real and it doesn't resonate with me at all. But when it's real, it like hits me in the chest and I'm obsessed. Like when something is so raw and so real that you're almost like, wow, that's, that's a lot of information. I love it. I'm like, that is so honest. That is so authentic. That's so real. That gets me super jazzed. That's how I like to create art. So when other people are doing it, that's what I'm drawn to. Mm, Very cool. Interesting. I was like hearing about why people are drawn to certain other people. I've realized that I'm very into like some of the people I like a lot um, in terms of like entrepreneurial icons. I really like Andy Frisella. I don't know if you know who that is, but he's my, he's amazing. He's my number one guy. And then Gary V changed my life. Grant Cardone. Um, uh, Russell Brunson, who's the founder of ClickFunnels. Um, but I'm tend to be, I was talking to a friend last night or the night before, and uh, I was telling him like, I'm very drawn to people with bravado. I really like admire like Floyd Mayweather, even though he's kind of acts like very arrogant. I lo- I just, okay. I'm so drawn yeah. to somebody who just, who does that. And I think Kanye West was the first person first. that I saw where I was like, oh my God, this dude's like this dude's really just saying how he wants to talk and yeah (laughs) it was the first time it was him it was Kanye and then it was Floyd Mayweather and and I just know I know where that comes from it comes from a place of I've been yeah and I've been exactly because I've they they come from a place of I've been at the bottom and I've been hurt and I've been bruised and battered and I've gone through my battle scars and I've let my inner voice and my demons take over and ruin my life. So the bravado, I'm not going to speak for Kanye and Floyd Mayweather. I just speak for me. I know the bravado for me is I'm just trying to, you know, for me, the energy of like the demons inside me, I call it my bitch voice. That's, that's, that's how I've heard it. And I'm just going to call it. That's how I talk. So like that. I love that. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know how else to say it. I am upset. Yeah. Yeah. So my bitch voice, I just let, I, I, I go, okay, well this, what I, I just came to this realization. <laughs> <laughs> I came to this realization recently. Why is it that I, why do I detest like people who throw pity parties and people who are soft? And why do I, why am I so like, why do I hate that person? <laughs> I heard someone say it on a podcast recently and I was like, oh, yeah. they said, because you see that in yourself, you know that that's in you. So when someone brings it out, you're too close. And like your bitch voice starts getting excited in my head. Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like you better stay in that cage. And, and so the bravado is deflecting those people. Cause anybody who gets it 
That makes total sense. Yeah. Yeah. So when I, when I show off and when I talk my shit and I do my thing, the people who are confident and like have been through shit and now are confident, look at me as, Oh yeah, I get that. And the people who would hate on that, who I haven't gotten to that point yet. I'm not big enough. When I get to that point, people hate on that. That's who I know. Okay. Those are the people who, who their bitch voice is too loud. So I want to get them. I want to get them out of the way anyway. You know what I'm saying? Right. What, what do you think of all that? That makes total sense. And I, I know that con- that concept so well of sometimes someone really bugs you and they get under your skin and you don't know why. And it's it's because you may recognize something in yourself you don't like in right. that person. And they're just like rubbing you the wrong way. Um, but no, I think that makes total sense. And kind of just going back to the, like the real deal people, like like you said, like when you get it, you get it. And when you resonate with someone, you resonate with someone. And going back to artistry, like always create what you feel called to create because you don't know how many people that's going to resonate with. And sometimes we feel like, oh, so-and-so's already wrote a song about this, or this is, you know, my experience, but everyone experiences this, but you never know who is going to resonate with that. And there's so many artists who aren't that famous that I'm obsessed with. They're like on my desert island disc, like my top five. And if they hadn't made their records, like my lives would be changed. And no, their audience may not be as big, but it impacted me so much to such a big scale. And you just never know what your art is going to do for someone. So just always creating what you feel called to and doing what you feel called to do because you have it for a reason. That's huge. And that ties back to part of the earlier part of our convo with the money thing. Because if you, if your priority is, Hey, I really want to impact somebody with this thing that I'm doing somebody like, okay. When I first started doing this shit, like nobody was hearing this shit. Like I was, you know, like yeah. when I was 17 years old, it was just the local people in my school, you know? And, um, I kind of started growing up doing the music thing. A couple of years went by and yeah people started kind of saying, Hey, like I've heard your songs, like they're really good. And I was like, Oh, I never would have expected this person. And then kind of same with the podcast, you know, like I started the podcast fucking in April. I don't remember what day exactly. Uh-huh. It was like in April. And I was just like, I have no idea who or if anyone's going to listen to this. And slowly I've seen the numbers grow. And then people say, people who I don't know say, wow, this episode that you did really impacted me. And I thought, damn, like that is, the point of it. And like, right. I never would have thought that that would happen because when I was, I was so long, so many times where I just put it out and got no reaction at right. all. I was like, Hey, right. did this work? Like, did I click post? <laughs> like I did, I did, but nobody <laughs> said shit. Yes. So, so you got to realize like for people listening to this, like, you know, if people have so much trouble figuring out well, what do I post? I'm like, dude, you got it. Like what Reagan just said, you got to post like what you're drawn to and you got to post yeah. in a way where, Hey, I'm just going to try to impact somebody with this. I'm not going to try to be anything and just yeah. eventually somebody will come to you. You know, you have to keep putting it out though, and you have to do it a lot. You obviously have yeah. to promote it. Um, so yeah. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, I also think that a lot of artists have trouble. Artists have said to me, I don't want to keep putting out music and nobody hearing it. And so they don't put out music and I go, okay, that's fine. But I don't think because you don't have a marketing plan, you should stop putting out music. Why don't you just keep putting out music and keep trying to figure out the marketing at the same time? Because, um, you know, you, you know, eventually you have to, eventually you're going to have to blow up and you need to practice that stuff. Right. Um, right. I, there's something to that too, that I've always believed, like there's some, yes, I totally understand like putting music and you know, it's the same thing over and over, no one hearing it, but also like when people keep playing out, you know, like when right. people are hearing your music, like you're going to have authentic connections and you're going to hear what people's experiences were to your song. Like that is a great way to test out your songs, which ones you want to put out, like playing it live and getting feedback from, and I love going to different, cause you know, now, Nashville, everyone's a songwriter and everyone's this, that, and the other. I love going outside of Nashville, going to other cities and playing shows where it's just normal ass people who aren't like in the music business, who just love music and hearing their opinions and their experiences listening to my songs. Um, So, you know, always like seeking out live. I can't, I know we can't do that as much right now, but you know, go on Instagram live and play and just get response and then seeing which ones really took off before you put them out and seeing who resonated with it. Absolutely. Well, listen, I I think that this episode has been 
one of my favorites. This is, we talked about so many different things. So many uh, things. <laughs> I would love for people to get a way to connect with you. So what's the best way for people to get in touch if they want to hear more from you and if they want to say hello to you? So I do have two Instagram accounts just because I keep my personal music separate from my business. You can follow me at Reagan Ray Music if you want to hear my songs. Um, if you want to hear more of the wellness, art, coaching side of things, you can go to Creative, Creative Coaching 13 um, on Instagram or you can go to my website, mycreativecoaching.com. Um, you know, I'm on TikTok now and I try to like give advice on there or like share things my clients are learning. Um, I just post things on there sometimes. And then what else am I on? Facebook, of course. So all of the platforms you can find me on. Um, so yeah. Wait, your, your Instagram, it's creative coaching underscore, right? I think so. Yeah. Creative coaching underscore. Cool. Yeah. I was just, cause I just looked it up and I, and I, and I saw and you, that. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, so creative coaching underscore. Yes. Oh, this is dope. Love this. Yeah. <laughs> This is, this is it. And then Reagan, R-A-G-A-N underscore R-A-E-M-U-S-I-C. I'll obviously link it in the description. So yeah. Thanks. Reagan, thank you so much for coming on. This has been one of my favorite episodes. This is the kind of talk that I'm into. So thank, thank you so much for having me. This has been so fun. I can talk about creativity for hours and I really appreciate you having me on. This was so yeah. fun. Would love to have you on again. We can maybe take one topic and like really dive into it. I would love to do that. Yeah. Um, maybe next time. time we'll plan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no problem. So guys, if you got any value out of the episode, leave a rating, leave a review, subscribe the pod, share it with a friend, go follow Reagan on Instagram. Um, thank you so much, Reagan. Um, I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you so much again for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. See ya.